I think that's the story of this film is, is you know, if there's, if there's ever an opportunity for um, connection or love, no matter how much it's going to hurt or how fleeting it might be, we should all take it. We should absolutely 100% take that chance um, because we will know so much more about ourselves through our relationships with others. Um, so you and I are basically about almost exactly the same age. Yep. And it struck me while watching this film that like, oh my God, Jamie Bell is playing a proper adult. Yeah. <laughs> In a way that kind of really struck me uh, hard. Is that the way that you conceived of this role when you were approached for it? To suddenly be re receiving dad parts? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Because, you know, I'm still a 12-year-old a, a ballerina boy in my, in my mind and in my heart a little bit. And I'm sure that's, you know, I think whenever I kind of talk to people who kind of have some mild concept of who I am or the things that I might have done, and I tell them that I have three kids, they look like they're about to vomit. Um, <laughs> I'm the, the kind of barometer of time for a lot of people, and it scares them. And that's what this film is about, right? So much of it is about time and the time we have and how precious it is and how fleeting it is and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, I, it was, uh, you know, playing Andrew's dad was such a, a pleasure. It really was, yeah. So the film is based on a book, but it's also heavily autobiographical for the director, Andrew Hay. So what sort of conversations did he and you have about sort of his relationship with his father before you started filming? Very little. Mm -hmm. I think um, Andrew is this beautiful person who's so willing to um, be honest and raw and really reveal himself. I mean, I just can't imagine that the stress of sending a screenplay like this to strangers when, when it's about your life and about your relationships and your experience. So I was so grateful to receive it. Uh, and um, and that when he told me the way that he wanted to capture it, you know, I don't know if you know this, but the house that we are in is his childhood home. That's the house he grew up in until he was 12 or something. So, and so he basically, he went with the producers, he knocked on the door and he said, can we shoot this film here? And they said, yes. And, and then he, he recreated it to make it look exactly the way it was when he was a child. So the generosity of someone, first of all, to kind of write their story and, and, and want you A, to be involved with it, but B, the way that we're going to do it is we're going to do it in this very, not in a studio, it's not a cold place. It's it's not somewhere where um, it feels empty because that, that's kind of where th those places can kind of feel. It's full of memory. It's full of um, probably pain or it's full of happiness or it's full of joy. And so you're in this this very... And houses in England are so fucking small. It's crazy. <laughs> they had such a hard time getting equipment in and out and stuff. So... But the space then suddenly feels completely different. And the way you occupy that space is suddenly different. Um, but at the same time, the brilliance of Andrew Higgs is that he, we, we never felt burdened by his own personal stuff. He, it, it didn't feel heavy with it. He knew that we were all going to kind of bring something very um, personal to it ourselves and bring so much of ourselves to it. And uh, um, but we didn't really talk about parenting or fathering or anything like that. The, the only thing that he said was reach out to Andrew Scott with love. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. I know the house is in uh, Croydon. For people who are unfamiliar with London geography, what can you tell them about Croydon? It's a fucking nightmare because it's about an hour outside of London where we were all staying. <laughs> so it was a bit of a nightmare to get there every day. But I tell you what I did on those drives is... Um, a lot of the music in this film was, uh, some of it was familiar to me, but um, The Power of Love is a song that I hated quite strongly. Um, so it was, he's, and Andrew Haig, if you, if you know his, his work, he's very specific about his music choices. So I knew it's, this is going to be in this movie. It's going to end this movie. Um, and, and weirdly, on those drives, I would listen to this song all the time. And I knew how kind of, the, the song kind of grew on me and I kind of felt how epic the song was. And then it, it became aware to me just how much we need to fill this film to earn that song. We need to fill it with so much feeling that by the end of the film and the catharsis of the film for the character should feel like the two match each other. So actually the drive became really useful because I was like, oh fuck, I've got a, I've, we've all got a big job to do here. And, and that became really obvious. When you were preparing to sort of invest that much feeling into something, do you have any sort of 
prep or routine that sort of gets you there? Um, fortunately for this, the script is so good. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we didn't rehearse a lot. None of the actors really rehearsed. I, I was in a room with Andrew and Claire for about an hour before we started filming, and we didn't even like read lines. What did you do? I think it was a moment for Andrew Haig, the director, to look at us and go, fuck, is this going to work? Is this, is this actually crazy? Is this like absurd? You look like their child. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and I love that about a director. I love doubt. Mm -hmm. And in all creative types, if you have doubt, I think you're onto a winner. Because we, doubt means you, you invest more. Doubt means that you are... You, you are curious about something. That curiosity kind of lives throughout and it lived throughout this process. I, 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 I think sometimes, you know, Andrew's climbing into bed in, in those pajamas. It could be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It could be absurd. Um, uh, but, I, but I just think the, the investment of everyone and the way that everyone brought parts of themselves to this, um, as soon as, the, you know, as, uh, day one I'm filming, we did all the parent stuff first. So for Andrew, which was brilliant, we, we did everything basically in chronological order of the parent stuff first. And then we, we said goodbye to him and then literally said goodbye. And we flew away and he shot the film with Paul. Shot a complete different film. Um, but after one hour of filming, Andrew came to me and Claire and he said, this is so weird, but you are his mom and, uh, and you are his dad. And, and that was it. And it, that's just kind of... You know, we didn't really think about it or talk about it. There was no, we didn't rehearse these scenes at all. We kind of walked them through. Mm -hmm. Andrew Scott's a brilliant performer. You just look at him and you just have to be open and listen to him and react to it because he's he'll give you everything you need, mm -hmm. everything. You mentioned that you are a father of three. Yeah. How much did you draw on that experience for parenting an adult man? Well, the the central conceit was something when I read it was actually quite. Uh, for any of you that are parents, as a central conceit, is genuinely quite chilling, a concept. Yes. Because what you're seeing is when your child is older than you and you're getting to rehash the past, you're, you are seeing the fruits of your flaws. You are seeing the fruits of your failures and some successes, potentially, but, but no one prepares you for that feeling when you go to bed every night that you feel in some ways you may have failed your child today. In maybe small ways and maybe large ways, but... It's a genuinely quite horrific feeling that you, and, and you wake up every morning, you go like, God, I hope I do better today for them. And inevitably mm -hmm. in some way you'll kind of fail again. And, and that's kind of what parenting is. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, so, so with my children, I hold this movie so profoundly every day when I'm with them. Because this movie makes me aware of just how vulnerable we all are and how parents don't really know what they're doing, but they are just trying to do their best. And how inevitably you will harm them in some way, but the hope is that, um, you you know, the hope is that eventually you hold them in some way where they feel understood. And what more can you do, I think, mm -hmm. ultimately? And, and I never, I, I grew up without a father. Mm -hmm. So, so much of my life, <clears throat> all I wanted was a dad to sit down and say, I'm sorry that I wasn't there. And then, of course, the work finds you in a place where you're playing a father sitting down and saying, I'm sorry, I wasn't, you know, um, which is brilliant because in some ways I didn't have a father to, to learn mistakes from. You know, I learned, I, I did my own mistakes, I suppose. But um, so the film is cathartic for me. It's, it's very, it's impossible not to bring yourself to it as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm grateful for the experience because... Uh, I've gotten to work through that and hopefully other people can find some catharsis in it. Some other people who didn't have that conversation can find that, that moment that maybe they needed. I imagine your kids haven't seen the film yet. No. no. <laughs> when do you think... She, you, my no. four-year-old loves Barbie. When, so, you know, when do you imagine Barbie. you'll be ready to show it to them? Oh, I would love for them to see this movie. Yeah, yeah I, w I really would. I, I mean, I think um, something so... It just I feel like this what Andrew Haig has done, our director, is, um, is something so beautiful and so universal in terms of what people can take from this. And it's come back to me in so many ways. Uh, I've heard from people that I've genuinely kind of forgotten about, that I worked with 10 years ago, who I didn't know were gay when I worked with them. And, 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 the, and they said that their father passed on and the, 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 their father never accepted them. And, and in some ways, this is some kind of spiritual... Um, closure for them 
you know, and uh, like that was just an email that I got one day. Well, and there's been a bunch of those, and 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 in meeting people and talking to them afterwards. Um, it's funny the film touches people in very different ways because we have such complex relationships with who we are and with the people that raised us. So, yeah, lots of different varied reactions. No, I imagine. One of the things that's interesting about this film is that there are no. The film never really sort of explains what is going on with yeah. you and Claire, yeah. which which is which is lovely. It's just sort of you just have to take it. Um, but I'm curious, did you? to yourself sort of think about like what are the rules of our existence and how we sort of interact with the world. I think Claire like maybe asked two questions of that. Uh -huh. Claire Foy asked two questions of that to our director and he went, don't, just stop. Because <laughs> as, as soon as you open this box, we're all fucked. <laughs> and I think genuinely as a screenwriter, he's not interested in it. Yes. And I agree, I, I, I'm not interested in it particularly either. Um, the issue is as an actor, Usually in preparation, you're always kind of going, well, what was I doing the second before this scene starts happening? Or yeah, you know, exactly. what am I doing after this thing? Uh, but with this, we could. there was no way of even really talking about that at all because they, they only kind of exist to him mm -hmm. in the way that he is remembering them. And the truth is that we are kind of renderings of his memory. We're not even truly who we actually were at the time, I think. Um, so we really leaned off that stuff. And we went, um, the only way to really do this, like I played him as alive. Uh -huh. I was like, this character's alive. That's it. Uh, yeah, so that's what I did. Was playing him as a memory different than playing someone who is a full three-dimensional person? Well, I just felt because it's his memory. It was specific uh -huh. to him. But, but it, well, that wasn't important to me in the way that I approached it, really, because... Um, you know, memory is such a tricky thing. Yeah. It can't be trusted, ultimately. Um, especially a 12-year-old's memory. It's kind of, it's all slightly warped anyway. But I think what Andrew Scott is doing quite specifically is quite unbelievable in this film because he, he, is, he is, the journey of this character is a kind of regression. It's a regression back into childhood. It's a regression back into vulnerability. It's a regression back into safety. You know, almost like womb kind of territory, you know, bless you. Um, so, um, and what he's, this trapped adult and this trapped child, both kind of coming out in various ways spontaneously, that, that for the physical performance that he does, it was really shocked by and quite unprepared for. And it's kind of left a real lasting impression on me. There's a scene where I kind of tell him, we have to leave now this whole thing is going to end and we got to go. And I can't remember if it's in the film or not, but on one of the takes, he he, he reached out and, and put his hand on my nose so I couldn't say the rest of it. And that's something my four-year-old does because in a kid's mind, it's like, well, if he doesn't say it, it won't exist. <laughs> and it was so, um, uh, so like jarring mm -hmm. um, and so moving um, that... Uh, I don't, I, yeah, Andrew Scott's just a great actor. That's the end of that, of, of that <laughs> question. No, I think everyone here would agree with that. Um, so you mentioned that you didn't, you don't, you, on this one, you didn't do the normal actor thing of like, what did I eat for breakfast today? You were like, we don't do that. Did the, there are little hints of like who this guy is, right? There's, there's the mustache, he has an accent. How much of that came from you and how much of that came from Andrew Hay? I looked at all the male role models in my life that I have looked up to. So my grandfather and my uncle and my godfather. I remember very like specific stuff about like touching his beard and going like, oh, whoa, weird hair on a bed. <laughs> That's so bizarre. Um, and the sweaters that they wore and 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 um, just kind of how out of touch a general, I mean, this is also in England, right? So yes, exactly. That's quite specific. So just kind of how out of, out, out of their bodies these men kind of were and are. Uh, feelings weren't particularly really discussed. You know, we also have to consider that this is when the film set is 80s England, this is pure Thatcherism. This is pure um, uh, a generational prejudice towards a group of people, marginalized people. And I felt it in the 90s growing up on playgrounds and in, in, in on football fields as a child, just the, the, this, this hatred for this community, this, this devilization almost of, of, a, of, a, of a people. So, and that was me as a kid going, oh my God, you can't, don't be gay. Yeah. It's the worst thing you can possibly be is be gay. 
So and that was how I felt as, as, a, as a child, like feeling that from, from people. Um, I then made a, I made this film Billy Elliot, and that was like so embraced by the the, the gay community, and 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 then you know just suddenly being on the other side of this, yeah, of that, and and going, oh my god, like it really grew up in this terrible time ter and, and terrible moment, I think, in British culture, and I've been so embraced by that community my entire career, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so when I consider the character as a parent of a child at that time who was gay, would be devastating, absolutely catastrophic. Um, so I think what Claire does is unbelievable in that scene. It's so unexpected. The way she handles it, she has this whole story about her son. He's straight, he yes. has a job, and probably maybe hopefully has a kid. That's not how that scene goes. That's just not how it goes. And. Um, I feel the experience of growing up and feeling that um, quite pervasive um, yes. homophobia um, was I really, when he's saying, I'm sorry, he's still hurting him. You know, he mentions like, every time I cross my legs, I think about, I, I feel shame. And that's just, that's just a tiny physical gesture that this man feels. And he's felt it for 40 something years. Um, so there's a lot of weight to all of that stuff that I, I that just my own personal experience of growing up at that time was so useful. Yeah, I guess use. generation. And also great eventually yeah. not to not to shy away from it. Sorry. Yes. No, generationally, I was about to say you were sort of halfway in between the Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal characters yeah, exactly. in terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a yeah, sort of a fascinating thing. Yeah. Um so you mentioned that you and Claire sort of shot your parts first and it was, you know, you did your bit then, you know, they did the rest of the movie. When you were in a th situation like that, how much are you thinking about the film as a whole and the, the, whole, the whole sort of gestalt of the project versus I'm just going to concentrate on my bit and we'll do my bit and then they will handle the rest? I think we knew the impact that, that, that we as his parents had to kind of make for him. Mm -hmm. and the kind of, he needs to make emotional strides forward. We need to feel like this man is kind of being broken down to be built back up again. So that was, it was clear that those scenes had to have emotional resonance um, and some impact, but um, uh, f I mean, f fortunately, I just think that we were just given a space that was so open and warm and, and trusting to be able to do those scenes. I mean, for example, I come in every day and go into the makeup trailer and and people, the, the energy would be so down, so low, so heavy. I'm like, guys, what's, what's, what's going on? They'd be like, Andrew came out to Claire yesterday. It was so intense. <laughs> and everyone, everyone is kind of going through this experience with him. And, and all the HODs and, and, and all the people who are running those departments were kind of bringing um, photographs of their own families and stuff for reference. So, so I've never really worked in a film where everything was just, every, everything meant something to someone because we all are children of someone. Someone got us to this point today and... Um, and it was impossible to ignore that. So, so the we knew that the parental stuff in the, in the movie was going to be important, um, and it, and it was just about being as honest and, and, and as truthful as we, we could in those scenes, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Claire's big scene, mm -hmm. but you also have quite an intense scene where sort of where you know it was really hit me where it's sort of the fantasy of telling your parents something that has always been unsaid. Um, and I'm just curious about what your process was for that scene in particular. Um, desperately trying not to mess it up. One, uh, two, we did coverage on me and then they were like, we're breaking for lunch. I was like, you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and then when we came back from lunch, I couldn't fucking remember anything. And I was like, oh, this is a mess. I'm all over the fucking place. But I use music a lot. Um, what music did you listen to for this one? Oh, I can tell you very specifically. It's a cue from Hook that reminds me of being a child and the and this line that someone oh we're in the robin williams theater wow yeah and i wanted robin williams to be my dad as a kid what qualities in robin williams attracted you as a potential I father mean, he's a magic that man he's like a man of magic it's impossible to describe him in words only feelings will suffice with him and um so, so that reminds me of my firstborn, my eldest, my son, 
And so I went to that icky, weird, awful place um, after lunch. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, so, it's about, I mean, outside of that, the script really was a, a document that was that was best if you didn't project too much of your bullshit onto it and just let it speak for itself. And that's what we, as much as possible, wanted to respect the text and and what Andrew had initially intended. And that's I think I think that's what you see. Mm -hmm. So I think we've reached uh, near the end of our time, but I'm just curious if you met the grown-up version of one of your children, what would you say to them? Sorry. <laughs> Probably, yeah. In some ways, in some ways, you know, of course, because. You you are you know that's the central conceit of this film. It's it's that's the thing that was most scary to me. Is why I kind of felt like I absolutely had to do it. Um, uh, I think the hope would be that you have managed to raise someone who is willing to take leaps of faith when it comes to having connections with others. I feel like the the character that we meet in the beginning, Andrew Scott's character, is so isolated and disconnected because of the person, the narrative that he has written for himself, the story that he has mm -hmm. authored for himself, and the hope that. In some ways, you could then course correct that and and help him be someone different and find someone some meaningful relationship and open himself up and accept love and things like that. I think that's the story of this film. Is you know if there's if there's ever an opportunity for um, connection or love, no matter how much it's going to hurt or how fleeting it might be, we should all take it. We should absolutely 100% take that chance. Um, because we will know so much more about ourselves through our relationships with others. And um, I would hope that my conversation with my child would be something along those similar lines. Well, thank you. Please uh, join me in. Guys, I'm so grateful for you for spending Bell. your evening tonight. Thank you very much.